I'm Monty Halls, and I'm on a mission to solve some of the greatest mysteries in the world of diving. From the deadliest dive sites on Earth. We have a composting diver. To missing treasure in an African lake. Is there a safe full of gold? From Japan's lost Atlantis. It's an extraordinary sight. To the most perfectly preserved wreck I've ever seen. This is deep and dangerous diving. It's a really tight squeeze. That will push me to my very limits. This is Namibia in southwest Africa. It's home to the Namib and the Kalahari deserts. It's one of the most desolate and arid places on earth. And yet I've come here to investigate one of the most powerful and evocative of all diving mysteries. I'm heading north from the capital Windhoek, out of the deserts and across this vast country to Ojikoto, one of only two lakes to be found in Africa's driest nation. I've come here to solve a mystery from the dark days of World War I, a mystery involving 60 million pounds worth of lost treasure. You don't get too many chances in life to do something that is a genuine adventure, that has that whiff of the pioneering spirit about it. What we know is that on July the 8th, 1915, the defeated German army in Namibia came in secret to Lake Ojikoto and dropped its weapons off the steep cliffs to watch them sink beneath the green waters. This marked the death of their colonial ambitions in southwest Africa. Legend says that the Germans also dropped a safe into the lake containing six million gold marks. It's never been found. It's a bit of a boy's own adventure, really, and I just desperate to get on with it and get the camp set up and find out what's lurking in the lake. I've been dreaming about diving this lake for years and it's taken months of planning to get here. But finally, our first sight of Lake Ojikoto. Oh, look at that. The legendary lake. That is quite impressive, isn't it? Journey's end. This is everything we hoped it was going to be, and more. It looks so mysterious. Uh, this sort of slightly green water, the deep walls, you know, just plunging straight in and, and down and into nothing. Just awesome, awesome. We, of course, will not be the first people to dive this lake. The British and South African armies began a salvage operation here in 1915 and winched out some cannons and ammunition. And then, 50 years later, with the advent of scuba gear, amateur divers recovered more military artefacts. But what's extraordinary about this lake is that most of it is still in there somewhere, waiting to be found. They put a sign up by the lake just to show what's still in there. So this isn't what's been recovered, it's what's still sitting on the bottom. You've got eight field cannons, two automatic machine guns. These are huge, by the way. They're not like something you hold, they're something on wheels. You've got two revolver guns, four mountain guns, and three smaller mountain guns, all big, almost artillery pieces. And best of all, you've got mysterious safe, contents unknown. So it's on a sign, so it must be real. We aim to succeed where others have failed. We're bringing new technology to find the missing guns and the 60 million pounds worth of gold. With state-of-the-art diving kit, we'll be able to dive longer and deeper than anyone in the past. We'll be using sonar and new computer mapping systems to locate anything big down there and to create the first 3D map of the lake bed. We've brought a lot of gear and with the sun dropping fast, we need to finish setting up camp. Could be worse, can it? You're putting up a base camp in the African bush to explore a mythical lake for a safe full of lost gold. <laughs> it's not too shabby. 
I'm sure the local Bushmen are watching us with the same level of bemusement as they did in 1851, when European explorers first discovered Lake Ojikoto. The Bushmen have strong superstitions about the lake. The local tribes believe that anyone who swims in the lake will disappear forever. And there have been deaths here. In 1927, local postman Johannes Cook dived into the lake and simply disappeared. His body was never found. Ojikoto looks like a beautiful, harmonious place, but slip beneath those tranquil waters and you enter a deadly environment. Very quickly, the light bleeds away and you're in pitch darkness. Sloping ledges lead you down into a maze of tunnels and caves. Should anything go wrong, you're hundreds of kilometers from anywhere. So I'd say for me, this probably represents one of the most challenging expeditions of my diving career. I'm going to bed tonight, excited at the prospect of the first dive tomorrow, but just a little bit nervous too. Today, our expedition begins in earnest as we make our first dive into Ojikoto. In the past, local farmers used the lake water to irrigate their land. The pipe work is all around us. Our local dive experts, Steph and Chris, are using the old industrial structures to give us easy access to the lake. And what's more, they've built a dive platform too. I've brought a suitably experienced team out with me from the UK. Our dive supervisor is Kevin Gurr, legendary explorer, cave and wreck diver. We've got two renowned underwater cameramen in the shape of Rich Stevenson and Dan Stevenson. My safety support diver is Dan Burton, who, by the way, salvaged $50 million worth of silver from a wreck in the Gulf of Mexico. This is dive one. It's a kind of logistical exercise because what you do is shake out all your kit, make sure everything's working. But of course, it's much more than that. It's the first chance to step into Lake Ojikoto. Yeah, that's good seal on there. Good. You know your straps on the side, yeah. so you can just adjust yeah. those yourself. Okay, my dear chap then, I'll do a comms check with you uh, once you're in and just below the surface, yeah? You okay there, Mum? Good luck. There are no accurate maps of Ojikoto beneath the surface. So on this dive, we want to start to build a picture of the environment. Down below, the rocky overhangs and tunnels provide clues as to how this lake was born. The lake was created when a fissure in the rock filled with rain. Gradually, the rainwater eroded it and created a, a small cavern which in turn became a huge cave. Eventually it became so big that the roof caved in, creating the extraordinary lake you see around me. And the lake is home to a species of fish that you'll find only here and in neighboring Lake Guinness. These fish are called Canapia guinnessana. You can see they come in this beautiful range of colours. And you literally don't find them anywhere else in the world. The lake stretches beneath me into pitch darkness. On our next dive, we'll have to go down into that eerie, unforgiving world in search of the safe. Should there be a safe full of lost gold at the bottom of this African lake?
1915, the German army threw guns and ammunition into the lake. But did they also drop a safe full of gold coins in there too? I'm looking for clues that might help us locate the gold. So I want to know what the Germans were doing here more than 8,000 kilometers from home. And finding the answer to that question starts here. This is the Namibian town of Swakopmund. It nestles between the Atlantic Ocean and the Namib Desert. Although I must say it doesn't look or feel terribly African. And that's because this town is thoroughly German. In August 1884, Germany took Namibia as its colony and imaginatively called it German Southwest Africa. Swakopmund became the main harbour. When the first 120 soldiers and 40 settlers arrived, there was just a barren coastline and desert. They had to make cave shelters in the sand. But walking around today, you can see just what a wealthy trading centre Swakopmund became. It's like a perfect little Bavarian town, but in Africa. By the early 20th century, thousands of Germans were passing through here on their way to a new life. To protect his citizens and defend the territory, Kaiser Wilhelm set up a colonial army known as the Schutztruppe and sent them to Southwest Africa. Even today, evidence of Germany's great Africa adventure remains. But the fact is that their rule over this part of the world lasted a mere 30 years and came to an end at Lake Ojikoto. So what can the lake tell us about that story and what mysteries does it contain? To answer these questions, we need to dive Ojikoto again, but this time we'll have to go much deeper. With that in mind, I decide to meet Theo Schumann, one of the original divers who explored the lake in the 70s and 80s. So Theo, this is very much your stamping ground. This is your home turf, isn't it? The lake? Very much so, Monty. Uh, I believe to be the second person that dived in this lake. And, right. And at first I was actually directly behind us, right. down there to about 35 meters, and we then found one of the first ammunition carriers. Would you say, Theo, with all your experience here over all the years, that the lake still holds some secrets? Absolutely. There is no doubt. Uh, and one of them being, of course, the fact that the safe is potentially in the lake. Mm -hmm. Now, the story goes that uh, there was gold or diamonds um, in the safe and that it was thrown into the lake. We did try and find it approximately 15 years ago, but there is in places up to three meters of mud on the bottom, or silt rather, not mud. And anything that's heavy will uh, eventually sink in. Theo and his colleagues discovered some guns and ammunition carriers lying on a ledge, directly below where we believe the Germans threw everything in. We're going to go down to locate the guns and properly explore the ledge for any sign of the safe. I know this will be one of the toughest dives I've ever done, and going that deep in pitch darkness will be a first for me. It is dark and horrible down there. It's going to be silt. It's going to be a major hazard on this dive. Just be real careful. Dan's going to put a strobe on the um, split point on the line. Yeah. So we've got a reference point to get back to. Also, we have live munitions on the bottom. From the pictures I've seen, most of it looks like anti-personnel shells. Doesn't mean to say they're nice and yeah. safe just because yeah. they're anti-personnel shells. Yeah. So don't touch anything. The nearest recompression facility we've got is in South Africa. We obviously are in Namibia. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, it's going to take at least two and a half hours to get a plane to here, and then we have to get a plane initially probably to Johannesburg, and then they'll deal with us from there. Just to summarise, we're in the middle of nowhere. It's deep, it's dark, and there's bombs. Yep. Excellent. And zero visibility. And zero visibility, of course. <laughs> Excellent. Plenty of peril. Yeah. At 60 metres, we're entering the territory of serious diving and the conditions will be a huge challenge for me. We're using the latest diving technology, rebreathers, which recycle every breath to allow us to go deeper and longer than normal scuba systems. This should give us ample time to really explore down there. 
with our current driving equipment, which is normal open circuit scuba equipment, we don't have the extended bottom times, which are now possible with three breathers. And uh, that would make a tremendous difference. Diving on scuba to the depths of 50, 60, 70 meters, you have tunnel vision, so you don't get a picture of everything around you. And if you don't happen to stumble on something right in front of you, uh, it's very difficult. As the darkness closes in, I feel acutely aware of just how vulnerable we are down here. When you go down on a dive, um, the darker it gets, the more apprehensive you get. I try to stay focused on monitoring my systems and regulating my breathing. We're down at 120 feet of the and you can see how dark it is and how much the sink picks up. You really gotta watch yourself down here, you know? As we descend deeper into the lake, I feel as if I'm traveling backwards to a fixed point in history. Ah. And there, frozen in time, two First World War cannons an ammunition carrier, shells, and even bullets. That's an awesome sight. You're looking at vision history. This is one of the reasons why I die. The Tunnel Cross, historic moment. To finally see the guns lying in state in such an eerie place gives me great confidence because it makes the whole thing real. There's a ton of down here to leave. There's no reason why the state isn't. So we set about exploring the ledge. The safe isn't here, but it could easily have gone deeper into the lake, missing the ledge completely or rolling on down the slope. Perhaps the other guns are there too. Absolutely blown away. It looks exactly the way a lost artifact should look. It just emerges out of this darkness, just sitting there in a little, almost a little pool of light because the camera's lights illuminate it. it just looks eerie abandoned, lost, forlorn, just incredible, you know. Those guns lying in their watery grave represent the moment when a remote German colony became caught up in global events and tell a tale of great violence. On 28th of July 1914, the First World War began. Britain wanted to drive Germany out of Africa but didn't have the capabilities to launch an attack here. So they asked neighboring South Africa to invade instead. For the next step of the story, I've come to meet historian Gordon McGregor on the site of an old railway line near Ojikoto. After South Africa declared war uh, on the German colony, they invaded the colony with 60,000 troops against 6,000 German colonial soldiers. And the Germans fled along this railway line. So you're, you're fleeing, you're taking everything that's precious with you, obviously your armaments, uh, but also, of course, the safe. Yes, the safe. Do you believe that there was a safe and do you believe it went into the lake? It, it's quite possible that there was a safe and if they wanted to dispose of it, of course, the logical place would have been to put it into the lake. So why did the Germans throw all their weapons into the lake? Military commander Viktor Franka, outnumbered and surrounded, realized that surrender was the only option. But he would have been very aware of what was going on in Europe, where the First World War was raging. The British were desperately short of guns and ammunition. Viktor Franka was not about to betray his countrymen by handing his arms over to the enemy. Under his instruction, 
8,000 rifles were burnt, and then his men took cannons, field guns, machine guns, and a vast amount of ammunition and shells to Ojikoto and threw them off the cliffs. The following day, Victor Franca calmly surrendered to the South Africans here at Kilometre 500. It's caught me by surprise a little bit, this place, because it's very, very evocative. They say a location can have a memory. Well, it's highly atmospheric here. Uh, you've got the actual location where the treaty was signed. And of course, this tree, this is the tree that the treaty was signed under. And this, of course, marked the end of German colonial rule in Namibia. The Germans chose the perfect place to dispose of their weapons. Ojikoto is so deep and so dark that finding anything in there is like finding a needle in a haystack. In the past, divers could only conduct their searches by torchlight. Dive supervisor Kevin Gurr, however, is using sonar to make a detailed map of the lake bed and to identify targets for us to dive. Anything large will bounce back a signal. And if Kevin thinks any of these signals look like 60 million pounds worth of gold coins in a metal box or a large cannon, he marks their position with boys and then puts a special camera down to take a look. Nobody has scrutinised Ojikoto in such detail. What we're trying to do over the next couple of days is actually uh, survey the base of this lake. Obviously it's a sinkhole, so the roof has collapsed at some point. So what we're trying to do is pinpoint some key targets we can actually go dive so we're using a combination of sonar and gps and then we can actually draw a three-dimensional map of the base of the lake and hopefully pinpoint some of these good targets while kev maps the lake i'm going to sumeb the nearest town to take a look at some of the guns that have been salvaged from ojikoto over the years part of the whole rationale of this entire expedition is to try and bring history to life but there's a vivid representation of it already, and that's here in the Sumed Museum. There's a great story behind these guns because they were salvaged by hobby divers in 1984. These were amateurs who were working on the very limits of safety down in 60, 70 metres of water. These three amateur divers, Philippus, Rob and Tulio, rescued the guns and ammunition cases found in the museum today. After some loving restoration work, the guns look incredible, as they were the day they were pushed into Ojikoto. But sadly, during the recovery, a cannon slipped and the steel cable severed Tulio's arm. The gun has been named after him. It was a heroic effort by those divers back in 1984 to bring this kit up, but they could only go so far and stay so long. And the point of our expedition is we can finish the job that they started and explore all those other areas of the lake and maybe, just maybe, find that elusive safe. I couldn't find any information about the safe in Sumeb Museum. Even though the colonial German administration were great record keepers, it doesn't appear on any official document. But would they have recorded the existence of something so valuable to the enemy? Kevin has already identified some locations in the lake for us to dive. So he's called a meeting. Another area that is quite interesting where we know there have been some dives is an area kind of roughly around here, I guess, which I think we should make the focus of today. We know there's quite a lot of debris in that area, various things, some of it old, some of it uh, more modern. So the dive plan for today, this section, clean it out, mm. wipe it off, basically. Mm and then we'll plan for the deeper dive tomorrow. Yeah. It already feels like a picture of the lake bed is emerging. And now Kevin is sending us off to explore the ledge on the north side of Lake Ojikoto. A lot of dive surveying isn't based around what you do find. It's often based around what you don't. What you've got to do is eliminate areas. And to help in that task, I'm taking a metal detector down with me. Kevin was right. There's a lot of debris down here. 
the metal detector is going crazy, reading too many signals to be of any use. Our torch beams reveal a graveyard of old metal artefacts. This is obviously the side of the lake where people have thrown their junk in. But we don't find anything down here that looks like it dates back to 1915, so we feel we can eliminate this side of the lake from our inquiries. Well, it's a real junkyard down there, basically. You can tell everyone's just been chucking metal and all the bobs in here for the last few years. But this isn't a massive area we're searching, so it's important that the team just scans each area and says, OK, there's nothing there, there's nothing there. And eventually we'll come down to one hot spot that hasn't really been dived, hasn't been extensively explored, and has some interesting signatures on it on the depth sounder, and that's where we're going to focus the search. If we've got one chance of finding the safe, that's where it's going to be. Dive supervisor Kevin Gurr has been surveying the lake with sonar. Step by step, he's been eliminating sections of the lake bed, looking for dive targets. We're definitely coming up back to a kind of cone in the middle yeah. where the roof's collapsed. There's still some way to go, which means we have time to test another theory about where the safe might be. I've learned that Lake Guinas, Namibia's only other lake, is a few kilometres away. In 1915, before their surrender, the German army was spread out across the land here. Could Commander Franke have ordered the destruction of armaments in Guinas too? Or maybe just the same? It's a compelling thought. Yeah. What about Guinas? What can you tell us about Guinas? Uh, Guinas is... Uh... It's something really, really special as well. Um, it's also a sinkhole that has collapsed. But the difference is Guinness is this crystal turquoise, blue, 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 yeah. magical color, you know? Wow. And if you think about it, you know, if the German um, uh, officer in charge, you know, gave the orders to dump the safe and he was thinking, you know, um, British find the cannons, maybe they find the safe, you know? So he might have sent the safe off to the other, to the other site. It is literally, as we look now, the crow fly, 20 kilometers that way. Right. So by horse, it's uh, 40 minutes. If you've got a switched on exactly. German officer. Yeah, of course. Thinking, right, all the, yeah. the armaments go in here, but you, my man, you're Send going it. 30 kilometers that way with the treasure, yeah. with the riches of our nation, yeah. and they're going in exactly. the, in Guinness. Yeah. And they must have known which is the deeper out of the lakes as well, you know, so they said, let's head that way for, yeah, the, yeah. for the valuables. Yeah, yeah, well, certainly worth checking out. I, I hope so. Lake Guinness is just too intriguing to ignore. It's almost entirely unexplored. The focus for exploration has always been on Ojikoto, but could everyone have been looking in the wrong place? We know that the Germans were hiding valuable things all over the country. They were putting uh, diamonds in safes and burying them. They were doing iron ore in shafts and hiding guns in houses. So it's extremely plausible that they had thrown a safe into Gunias with perhaps other items. I've never seen a dive site like this before. This, this is what diving dreams are made of. And Dan's just wandering in. So. <laughs> <laughs> hey, We're going to go in there. What do you think of that? <laughs> Put me in the water. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Look at the colour. Guinness is even more remote than Ojikoto. But that hasn't stopped local farmers siphoning water for their crops. If it wasn't for all the irrigation works, access to the lake would be considerably more challenging. It's really unusual nowadays to find something that is almost completely unexplored. There's been a few dives here, but the depth is 100 metres. You're looking at a surface that runs all the way down to 100 metres. 
and basically the sides bow out. It's like a gigantic bell shape. It's such a rare opportunity for the team and myself to dive something like this and we're just beside ourselves. Can't wait to get stuck in. And there, in the crystal blue waters, a now familiar sight, Tilapia guinisana. Once only found in this lake, yet somehow they made their way over to Ojikoto. It looks simple to me that Bruno is connected to Ojikoto. This is an incredible dive, following the cliffs down into the abyss. We are alone in a 700 million year old collapsed cave. But as I'm not qualified to go down below 60 meters, all I can do is watch with envy as Rich and Dan descend to the bottom in search of gold. While the deep team do their thing, Dan Burton and I decide to circle the lake to be sure the safe wasn't caught on a ledge. Meanwhile, in pitch darkness, Rich and Dan finally make it to the bottom of Lake Greenus, a hundred meters below the surface. They've come in search of gold, only to find a rubbish tip. All you saw was rubbish. It's like a, a local's Disc dumping ground for yeah. the, all sorts of all sorts of rubbish and tats gone down there, yeah. which is a real shame. It is. You wouldn't see the safe. It's buried under three tons of plastic debris, I think, really. Yeah. It's a shame. It there, was, was there, was, there was nothing of that period. There was no raw no, material, nothing. nothing old. I'd come here with genuine excitement. I thought we'd stolen a march on other explorers. Of course, we can't prove in a day that the Germans were never here. And it would be too huge a task to examine beneath all the rubbish. One thing's for sure, though. We didn't find any German army artifacts down there. But today's dive has thrown up one possible theory about Lake Guinness. The really interesting thing is that maybe it is connected to Lake Ojikoto. And if that's the case, this is a world-class site for exploration. If there is a cave system right the way through, what a project that would be. But all I can say is this place has genuine magic about it. We've been in Namibia for a week now, searching for the missing German guns and, of course, the safe. We've conducted exploratory dives and visited relics from the First World War. With sonar, we've been eliminating areas of the lake from our inquiries and examining large objects on the lake bed. Every hour of the day, we're narrowing the focus of the search. But as our expedition time draws to a close, we're badly in need of a new lead. I've heard that a long-time local resident may have some information for me. Ilse Schatz is a historian and archivist who also founded the Sumed Museum. In fact, Ilse has done so much to record the history of northern Namibia that she even has a road named after her. I think it's probably fair to say that nobody knows more about Ojikoto than Ilse. Did you ever encounter, personally, meet anyone who'd been involved in yeah. that? Yeah. An old man came to me in the museum and said, I got a secret, please come to the lake. And I was afraid of that old man. I thought, what will he do with me at the lake? Yeah. yeah. But he said, please, there is a secret. So I closed the museum and I went with him to the lake. And he said, we put poles underneath and up, and poles underneath and up till the safe. 
is right. in the link. What you're saying to me, Ilsa, is incredibly important and significant. You are the only person I've spoken to who has a kind of eyewitness angle. Did it seem to you to be true? I think so. Yeah, yeah. And you say he was an old man? Yeah, Mr. Gerdes. Right, right. Who'd obviously been involved in the, in the army and in the retreat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. An extraordinary woman. The things she's seen and experienced. She's living history, this link with the past. And there comes a point in every investigation, you're following these clues and suddenly a legend becomes a fact. And for me, that was the moment when she said that she had met the man, he took her to the lake and said, this was the point that I put the safe into the lake. She believed him and I believe her. So now all we've got to do is find it. Ilsa's visitor, Mr. Gerdeff, was one of many German soldiers who stayed on in Namibia after the war. He was 26 when he pushed the safe into Lake Ojikoto. When Commander Franke surrendered to the South Africans the next day, 4,000 soldiers became prisoners of war. Mr. Gerdeff was one of them. Namibia immediately fell under South African control. It wasn't long before the new rulers learned what the Germans had done at Ojikoto and mounted a salvage operation there with the British Army. Showing extraordinary courage, a diver descended into the lake. Although he recovered guns and ammunition from shallow ledges, as this letter from the time points out, he was unable to go deep enough to find anything else. Undeterred, the British and South Africans spent days out on the lake, meticulously charting its depths with a plumb line. This drawing details the results of their research. Why were they making such a huge effort? My guess is that although they wanted the guns and ammunition, they were also secretly engaged in trying to find the safe. Just like us. For the last few days, Kevin has been heroically crisscrossing the lake, surveying it with sonar. Now he's ready to give us his results. Are you getting a warm, fuzzy feeling? Are you going to put the deposit down on your Lamborghini? <laughs> and your... There was a couple of small hard targets, but mostly it's up and down lake bed, yeah. really. Just silt banks, you know. But we're getting the odd bit of pipe work and yeah, all sorts of other bits and pieces really. But nothing really significant, unfortunately. Yeah. And we really plastered this area this morning. Right. So and you're then... pretty confident from the work that you've done here. If it's anywhere, it's where the cannons went in. Yeah, I would yeah. say so. I think that's got the highest probability. The sonar has not revealed anything in the lake itself. So Kevin is focusing our search on an unmapped area of the lake. Beyond the guns, the lake bed slopes away underground. It's highly possible that the safe tumbled down the slope and ended up at a position too deep for most divers to explore. To get there, we will have to enter a cave in pitch darkness. We have one dive day left, and we think this is our best shot. Today marks the final stage of our exploration of Lake Ojikoto in Namibia. For a week now, we've been diving it in search of lost guns and a safe full of gold coins. Detailed mapping of the lake bed has not revealed any promising dive targets, but we have found a deep cave beyond the reach of sonar. So everything now comes down to this. We have one last chance to liberate 60 million pounds worth of gold. Every diver I've ever known wants to find treasure. And in a way, when you're a little kid and you start getting all intrigued by this, it seizes your imagination, the thought of diving down and finding treasure, and it never lets go. All the effort, everything we've done over the last few days, all the hours the boys have put in, the deeper stuff, the exploration, the logistics, it's all come down to this dive. This is the one area we think 
en masse. If the safe's anywhere in this lake, this is where it is. My heart is pounding with excitement as the sunlight recedes behind me and we have only our torches to light the way. Once again, we're at the guns. But this time, we move on down the slope. We're now in virgin territory. And there, like a signpost saying you're heading in the right direction, is the wheel of a gun, long buried beneath the silt. <laughs> All our hopes now rest with Dan and Rich as they enter the cave. All I can do is wait nervously for their return. There's no sign of human interference here. The lake bed unlittered and unexplored. Diving underwater caves is incredibly dangerous. Disorientation, a major killer. So Richard is laying line to make sure they don't get lost. We had thought that this cave went back only 20 meters. But in fact, it continues to slope ever downwards. The pull of gold could lure them ever further on, but Dan and Rich are at the edge of their safety parameters, and it's unlikely the safe would have tumbled this far. They've given it their best shot. They follow the safety line out into the lake. Diving Ojikoto has been an incredible experience and one I will never forget. Fit. Last dive in Lake Ojikoto. So. You know, I got a feeling of sort of um, melancholy, really, to leave, and I uh, really, really want to come back. But there's more work to be done here, for sure, and there's more stuff to be found. Even though we haven't found the safe, we have left something for posterity. Kevin has created the first 3D map of the lake from his sonar research. There's lots left here to explore. Oh, there really is. There's a lot of areas in the lake that remain unexplored mm, mm. and are worthy of further projects, mm. I think. I don't know about the safe lying in any of them. This deep area, this mm -hmm. gully looks mm. fascinating, doesn't it? That, you can see the old river course there. Yeah. 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 Wow. Yeah, there's, Great plenty, there's plenty left for this place and for this country to give up for exploration. Yeah, definitely. Plenty left. Definitely. So Lake Ojikoto, the horrific, has not yielded its secrets. But there's still another possibility. My feelings are that the safe did go in, but that it was salvaged. I'm totally convinced by Ilsa and her conversation with that German soldier who said, come with me, I will show you where the safe went in. And I think it went in here and uh, with the guns. Now, I don't know what was in it, of course, but I'm convinced the safe went in. But there was a lot of people in that army, the 4,000 or so. Are they all gonna keep that secret? I don't think so. And I think the Brits and the South Africans found out about it and put a diver down and salvaged the safe. They salvaged guns. Why couldn't they have salvaged the safe? But of course, that is just a theory. I hope that the story of the Kaiser's Gold will inspire the imaginations of explorers for years to come. <laughs>